We always try to have a board member do a quick introduction of themselves and talk a little bit about Aurora. Um, you already know about me and we've talked about me earlier, so I'm going to skip that part. I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about membership and the impact that the Zoom uh, lectures are having on membership. So Aurora has about 550 members. Uh, January 1st is our renewal date and we renew for the calendar year. Uh, just so you know, 284 of you have uh, renewed your membership, so the other half of you get cracking. Um, most of our membership is in the United States, but we have members all around the world. Um, and in order for us to communicate with non-members, uh, we have a membership database and the non-members are what we call contacts. And we have about 1,500 contacts that we're allowed to have. Every time we do a new Zoom lecture, I run over that 1500 limit and I have to remove some of the people who haven't participated in a while. Um, but this, this lecture has been phenomenal. So right now uh, I am at 2042 contacts or 1542 contacts. We've had about 70 people uh, join our contact list uh, for this uh, Zoom presentation alone. We always get at least one or two new members out of each Zoom, and we're just happy to find people who are interested in rock art. And what we do with those contacts is, you know, we send you out an email about the next uh, the presentation that we're doing, and that's about it. We don't we don't do a lot of marketing. We're just if you're interested in rock art, we'll let you know about the presentations we're doing. Anyway, that's a, a little bit about uh, our contact list. The um, conference that we're doing is coming up in the middle of May. Let me find the specific date for that. Uh, we're going to be in Farmington, New Mexico. It's an exciting conference because uh, it's our 50th anniversary. And well, I've got to go to the website to find the specific date. So we're planning a lot of fun events uh, specifically for the 50th anniversary. Um, the, basic, the basic format will stay the same. We'll have a lot of great presentations on rock art topics, and we'll do two good days of field trips. The field trips are already kind of in the bag. We, we have all of those set up. I haven't put them into the website yet to get them in, in print, but uh, we know where we're going. Uh, so we're really looking forward to um, our time in Farmington. Okay, here's the conference info and the dates for the conference are May 16th through the 20th. So uh, the 16th is our field trip or field trips on the Friday, field trips on the Monday, presentations on the Saturday and Sunday. All right, now let me talk a little bit about Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is in it works for the Utah SHPO, the State Historical Preservation Office, as their public-facing archaeologist. So unfortunately for her, she has to talk to me a fair amount because I work with Urara and we interface with SHPO a lot. Um, as a public-facing archaeologist, she's trying to make archaeology understandable and accessible to the public. And she's doing some cool projects, like she's trying to reduce vandalism at rock art sites in uh, in Utah. She's also been a great collaborator with the Utah Rock Art Research Association. She regularly attends our symposia. Uh, this last year, she came and did a workshop on how to produce pigment. Um, I attended, it was fascinating, but it involved a lot of chemistry, which isn't exactly up my alley. But it really left me with an appreciation for the sophisticated pigments that ancient people were using and their capability to figure out how to do that and how to make things that would last for thousands of years on rock walls. Um, the project that Elizabeth is going to talk about tonight is, actually, is really fascinating. Uh, she had every SHPO summer intern, every Urara volunteer that she could find, and I think she cajoled archaeologists and interns from every government agency in Utah to come out and help her uh, document sites in the Vernal area. I'll let Elizabeth describe her project in a lot more detail, but let me just say that she's taking rock art documentation to 
a level that at least I have never seen before. And I think the results are going to be absolutely fascinating. So with that, I'll let uh, Elizabeth take over. Thank you so much, Troy. I I am blushing quite a bit. That was very sweet of you. Um, so let's, let's jump into it because it's going to be a busy night, guys. Um, so good evening. And thank you so much to Troy and to Ayara for having me on this evening. And it's been great getting to chat with a few of you over the last 30 minutes. Today, I'd like to introduce you to recent research funded in part by Urara, in fact, here in the Uinta Basin in Utah that uses rock imagery, also called rock art, to discover more about the Fremont people who lived there about a thousand years ago. In reviewing my presentation earlier today, I realized that I really stuffed this hour to the gills. So strap in, we're gonna move fast. Um, and there'll be questions at the end if there's anything uh, that I failed to address enough. Before we dive in, want you to know that the work you're about to see was conducted in the Uinta Basin. And so I would like to offer this land acknowledgement before we get started. It is our honor and responsibility to acknowledge that we gather today on land that is sacred to all indigenous people who came before us in this vast crossroad for the Utes, Goshutes, Paiutes, Shoshone, Navajo, Hopi, Eastern and Western Pueblos, and many, many more peoples and their ancestors. It has been their stewardship for time immemorial to care for this land and all of its inhabitants. We honor their memory, their physical presence in our state today, their ancestors' presence here in spirit, and we do so in our reverence for their resilience in preserving their connections to the creator. We honor the people and we honor the land. Last thing before we really get it started tonight is a little bit about me, because um, I know that there's a lot of unfamiliar names and faces um, for me, and so you're probably wondering who I am as well. So my name is Elizabeth Hora. I am public archaeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. And so most people probably live in a state that has a state archaeologist, and so I'm a lot like that. I represent Utah in the National Association of State Archaeologists, but because my focus is public archaeology, like Troy was saying, I'm always thinking about how I can make archaeology more accessible to people. And in terms of my own research, I use dating techniques to learn more about what the human landscape of the Uinta Basin would have looked like in the past. Um, and more and more, I've been getting really into rock imagery, which as you all know, uh, is really defies a lot of dating techniques. Um, it's really a tricky one. So because I'm not native or indigenous myself, I'm really careful not to suggest an interpretation for what rock imagery could mean. But I have started to wonder if I can apply archeological science, specifically some statistics, to the study of rock imagery. The Uinta Basin has a lot of sites with petroglyphs and pictographs, and I wondered what we could learn from how people portrayed themselves and each other graphically. So for about the last year, I've been looking into classic vernal style. Who made it? What does it mean? When were people making this style and so on? Classic vernal style was initially classified by Polly Shaftsma in the 1970s, and archeologists have used this term ever since to talk about the rock imagery of the Uinta Fremont. Does this term serve its purpose 50 years on? Is classic vernal style keeping up with what we know about the Fremont? And can the rock imagery be used to further push our knowledge of the diverse, contentious, and vibrant peoples and societies that archeologists are currently uncovering in the basin? Before we can talk about a lot of the rock imagery, let's back up and talk a little bit about the people who are in the basin. And I think a lot of us here this evening might not know where the Uinta Basin is or necessarily who the Fremont people were. So we'll just take a quick pause. So here we're looking at our timeline of Utah history. These are very, you know, thumbnail sketch, don't worry too much about dates. Even though I really love dating, for issues of timelines, if you're ballparking it within a few hundred years, it's fine. So for the Fremont period in the Uinta Basin, we're really starting about AD 400. The Fremont period can start earlier in other places as corn, beans, and squash arrive, as people sort of migrate in, change their life ways. But here in the basin, we're looking at about 400 AD. And then 
almost everywhere, the Fremont tradition ends fairly, not quite as abruptly as the Pueblo world, but fairly abruptly, uh, right around 1300. And so you can see, hopefully you guys can see my, my cursor here. It's, it's a flash in the pan, you know, going from the Paleo-Indian and Archaic period, going from just, you know, 10,000 years of human history to the Fremont period. Um, even though the Fremont were out there for about a thousand years, it's fairly, fairly short jump right here. And then we're hitting the late prehistoric, another short jump, and then historic and obviously modern. So in terms of time, a thousand years, a lot of time, um, not, as, not as deep as we see elsewhere in time. And then in terms of where we are regionally, if you're looking, if you're familiar with the state of Utah, you know, right here is the four corners. Again, I just, I'm praying you guys can see my cursor. Um, the four corners is right about here. This is Wyoming, Colorado. And so where we're looking is right in this area, um, really where the Uinta Basin is hitting the Uinta Mountains. That foothill region where it's really well watered um, is, we see that there's just like a huge fluorescence of people in the Fremont period. And so if you've never encountered the Fremont before, let's talk a little bit about them. Um, a lot of us, even today, consider the Fremont really in terms of their, their neighbors and possible cousins in the Pueblo world, right? So um, the Fremont were sort of a, for a while, they were considered the northern periphery of the Pueblo world. We now really understand that they are a distinctive people um, but we're starting to scratch the surface about how they are the same regionally and even sub-regionally and how they differ from each other. What we can say across the Fremont world and especially in the Uint Basin is that these were folks who from a economic subsistence level, they were blending farming and hunting and gathering. So unlike the Pueblos who were mostly all in on agriculture, the Fremont were a little bit more like, we'll pick it up, we'll drop it. You know, we'll take this on when we need to, but eh, if we don't need to, we're really good um, hiking along and snacking. That's that's really wonderful. Um, and you can even see throughout a person's lifetime that they're going to float in and out of this subsistence activity. Um, you can see that some people in society wanted or were were kind of maybe railroaded into living in villages. Some people wanted or were railroaded into living more of a um, semi-nomadic hunting and gathering life. What this really did for Fremont people is give them a lot of resiliency in their society because no matter what was coming down the bend, and you know, here in Utah, we have a wild swing in weather um, year to year. So folks were able to either rely on their friends and family in villages. If it was going to be a tough water year, they really needed to um, invest a lot in agriculture. And then on the other hand, once people were starting to build up surpluses, you were starting to get a little bit of that surplus economy. Now the foragers come in and they're bringing exotic trade goods from places as far away as California. So it really makes a vibrant lifestyle and a resilient lifestyle. I find that when we're thinking about the Fremont, when we're talking about the Fremont, we often are not thinking a lot about what their life looked like and felt like. So I've got a few slides where we're gonna talk a little bit about the texture of Fremont life. So obviously the Fremont were growing the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash primarily. Um, depending on where you are in the state, you know, if you're in the Southern part of the state, people are way more invested into agriculture like I said, up here in the Uinta Basin, we have everything from really small garden plots that probably were, you know, you'd throw your seeds out there, maybe you'd check on them a few times mid-season, and then you'd come back and be like, did I get anything? Did I, can I harvest anything? Um, we have that. And then even at 400 AD at a place called Steinecker Gap, we see that there's such an investment in agriculture that people are building canals. So we're really running the gamut. And there's a lot more to investigate about why certain aspects of Fremont society were going all in on the Three Sisters and why some were not. So on the other side here, we can see they also hunted and gathered wild foods. 
Um, this is the Great Hunt panel that's down in the Tavaputs Plateau. It's not super duper close to the project area, um, but it is an important corridor for people moving around. And we do know that um, Nine Mile Canyon, where this is from, is a really important passageway between sort of um, the Colorado Plateau and the Uinta Basin to the north. So obviously, I mean, we know that people are hunting. We can see this from just the archaeological record. We can also tell from um, C12, C13 traces in people's bones. Um, and there's been a lot of work done at this particular panel, in fact, to say like, oh, this looks like it's probably a fall hunting pattern, which is pretty exciting. Again, getting into the texture of life. A lot of us, when we're talking about the Fremont, talk about their subsistence economy, and we just kind of leave it at that. But the Fremont, we're doing a lot more than eating, right? A lot of us are doing a lot more than, well, not me necessarily, but some of us might be doing more than eating. Um, so, you know, here we've got just a few things to add a little bit of texture. Later, we're gonna add color. So we've got some sandals that were from the Uinta Basin. Um, these are a much coarser weave than a lot of the sandals you get further south, even the Fremont sandals you get further south. Because honestly, like you ain't using sandals that much of the year. Right now, the Uinta Basin, like at least where these sites are, probably has two to three feet of snow on it. Um, it's a nippy place in winter. But, you know, we've got we've got some sandals. We don't have as much clothing as I would like. But down here in the lower right, we do have a um, a reed mat or a juniper, what is it? Is it juniper? Juniper bark mat and a reed mat. We've got a few different options for mats. These are so brilliant, especially if you are a forager. If you are walking around all day from place to place, you're going to use a lot of rock alcoves to sleep, or you're just going to sleep rough out in the open a lot. But like us today, you don't want to be sleeping on the dirt. That's filthy, especially in alcoves. I'm sure everyone here has been in alcoves. It's a lot of mouse poop, a lot of mouse urine. So what do you do? You have a nice woven mat that you can shake out, dust off, lay down, nice, comfy, um, keep it clean, keep it sanitary. And if you're staying there for a few days or if you're using this in like a pit house, if it gets dirty, just take it out and shake it. Um, it's a really nice utilitarian tool um, that I think does give a little bit of feel for how people were living. We also have these bone gaming pieces. Um, people were participating in, if not recreation activity, then maybe some competitive gambling activity. Um, and then, of course, there is the famous Utah style matate. Um, so down here in the lower lower left, it might be a little hard to see because of the contrast, but a Utah style matate is usually a huge piece of site furniture. These things can be like 50 to 60 pounds. Um, this one's actually from my office. I don't know what it weighs. Um, and it has two basins, one that will fit your matate really nicely when you're not using it, and then it will fit some of your materials uh, that you need to grind. And then it has a much bigger basin that sometimes uh, doesn't have too much of a backstop on it. So you can just brush your materials right into your basket or tray. Um, this is just showing a huge investment in time when people are cooking their food. Um, they're making their food yummy. They're working hard on, on making some delicious foods. And of course they had pottery. So they were getting into the practice of stewing things perhaps all day long to really get that nutritional value out of things. And so now we've looked at the Fremont stuff. I'm kind of doing a, a really brief history of how archeologists came to the Fremont. The first thing we did because we were archeologists is we looked at the stuff and we tried to classify people by stuff because back in the early 20th century, that was how we all did science. And so then later in the mid to late 20th century, researchers started really struggling with the term the Fremont. Steve Sims and Dave Madsen in 1998 recommended that we think of the Fremont less as a socially cohesive group of people. And we think of the Fremont more as a behavioral complex in their words. And so what that means is kind of, um, a bunch of archeologically observable behaviors instead of materials, behaviors. Um, and those behaviors are like the tendency to grow corn, beans and squash while also hunting and gathering, right? That's what makes something Fremont. Um, they also noted the ability of the Fremont to change their way of life, like I was talking about. 
Um, and you're going to change your way of life to fit new environmental and social challenges. And like I said, this ability to kind of switch between um, modes of subsistence created that really resilient pattern of life that lasted for about a thousand years. Jumping a little bit beyond that, we're going to get into the 21st century now um, with some work that Linda McNeil's been doing with Dave Shaw and Scott Ortman. And they're proposing that at least in the Uinta Basin, there are two different groups of people that were cohabbing here and their life ways were different and perhaps complementary. Um, so I'm a little embarrassed because Dr. McNeil is here tonight. So is Dr. Shafsma, this is fine. Um, so let me just go really quickly through the, the current theory that, um, that I think we're probably seeing a lot in the rock imagery. So about 2000 years ago, down in the central Mesa Verde area, we just had a roiling cauldron of people. And when we look into the archeological literature, we can see, you know, about 2000 years, maybe a little bit before, um, as people were really intensifying their corn, beans and squash, they were settling into villages. We see people experimenting with how they wanna build villages. Some of these are huge successes. Some of these end in fiery holocausts. Um, it's not a guarantee that different people are going to be able to live together in, in a single society. I mean, that goes without saying, right? And so as populations grow, maybe as there's some tensions, there's some push-pull factors at work here, right? People start migrating out of the Central Mesa Verde area. One of the places that we believe they go is the Uinta Basin. So when we were talking about, you know, the, the Nine Mile Canyon area, that's right in around here. This is the West Tavaputs. Here is our project area in the Uinta Basin. And so the people who are speaking northward, or speaking northward, the people who are migrating northward are speaking a proto kanoan so proto kiowa Tanoan language, um, and a pre-Hopi language. So we're, my understanding is, this is languages, not people, right? Um, in the sense that we speak an Indo-European language, I don't recognize myself as being from the Indus Valley. But I do have sort of a, a community with other modern English speakers, right? So back in the day, these people who were speaking Proto-Kiowa, Tanoan, and Pre-Hopi, they probably were associated with each other. Um, they certainly were more associated with each other than they were with outside groups with whom they might not have been able to communicate very well. So these groups were migrating into the basin. They do arrive in the Uinta Basin right around the time period that we see a real pickup in our, um, our frequency of radiocarbon dates. And so for my thesis, uh, when I did my master's degree, I was really tracking a lot of radiocarbon dates. I can tell you that starting at about 200 AD, 200 BC, then to 200 AD, we're slowly creeping up. And then we just rock it up. The amount of people that are in the basin far outpaces um, what a normal population replacement would be, even if you were suddenly startlingly fecund. Um, this really had to be an in-migration. And so we do see that population peaking around 1000 AD. At 1000 AD, we're not 100% sure what happens, but we do start seeing an out-migration. And so it was proposed by McNeil and her colleagues that the pre-Hopi speakers were perhaps leaving first and that they were going to head south. Um, like I mentioned, the Pueblo down here, the Puebloan folks were probably cousins, cousins in you know, a sort of broad term of, um, they, were, they were related in some way. I mean, if they were pre-Hopi speaking, some of these people you know, found themselves onto the Hopi mesas, fused into the modern Hopi, they were cousinly enough to be able to do that. Um, and we do see that there's a lot of trade between these two areas. So there's a good reason to believe that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people moving together. And then later, right? Like I mentioned, the Uinta Basin, we do see that there's a good number of people there until about 1300, really does take a dive right around 11. Um, and then it takes a second dive at 1300. And although there are still populations in the Uinta Basin, people who would eventually become the Shoshone, the Ute, and others, um, we do see that a lot of folks have, have finished their migration outward by about 1300. And so um, McNeil and colleagues 
are suggesting that that's probably the Proto-Kiowa Chinoan speakers who are continuing their journey northward to Yellowstone where they'll hook over and around um, into the plains and really start their, their ethnogenesis into Kiowa folks that we know today. So really cool, right? We've got this idea of their material culture, this idea of how people are moving into and out of farming and foraging. And now we've got this extra boost of like, okay, well, we've got some ethnic identity. And like I said, we have classic vernal style. Classic vernal style is what we call the art that the Uinta Fremont peoples made. And if we find places with you into Fremont peoples, we know that we're also going to find classic vernal style. I mean, that Venn diagram is very nearly a circle. Um, classic vernal style in the 1970s when Holly Shapsma uh, first recognized it was a huge leap forward and continues to be something that archeologists use every day. It's our bread and butter. We still love classifying things that we see. Um, it makes it really easy for us to just quickly grok what's going on in the field. It makes it really easy for management as well. Now, once something becomes a management tool like that, once something becomes a quick and easy, you know, marker like that, we should start wondering, are we keeping up with the rest of the research? Um, it, back in the day, you know, cr creating this classification really opened up a world of understanding for archaeologists. Um, and now I think because we have such a huge database uh, that we've created, we're going to be able to take the next leap forward in not just classifying, but then applying some of this understanding to human behaviors. Um, I will note too that one of the big things that we're going to start tracking is this Eastern Western divide in the classic vernal style region that was theorized by Shafsma. Um, we Think that we might start seeing that. So that's pretty exciting. But before we get too much into results, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. We're going to take a quick look at the methods that got us here because boy, howdy, were those methods tough. Okay. So when I visited sites um, this last spring with local expert Darlene Corner and Linda McNeil, we noticed something. So we're going to use this panel as an example. So what you can see here is um, a pretty complicated composite photograph of one portion of one panel from just one site. Um, this panel in particular went on for like 30 feet. It was massive. Um, I think a lot of us, um, if the contrast on our screens is, is behaving nicely, we can probably see you know, some of these big dots, some of these big half circles, another big half circle, concentric circles. Um, but it's really jumbled up and it's really confusing. And so when we got there and we, you know, really stuck our eyeballs an inch away from this thing, we could see that it's because these are the layered remains of several different groups of people drawing one on top of another. So we're looking at hundreds of years of people writing on the same page. Which made field work really difficult. <laughs> That's why I'm bringing it up. In the field, we analyze which layers we're on top of and below each other. And from there, we could determine drawings of individuals or individual human shapes, what we called anthropomorphs or anthros for short. I'm just gonna refer to them from anthros from here on out. The other sort of, I mean, cool thing, but problematic thing with rock imagery everywhere is uh, the issue of colors. So in the field, and then again in the lab a second time, we drew about 500 anthros. We gave them all individually coded names. So um, just looking at this person here, you could see there's a lot of little dots. That was how we, we indicated that this was a petroglyph. Um, this here is a pictograph. Um, this is color matched to the dominant kind of red that was in there. It looks more ready when it's on like a pale tan rock. Uh, here it looks kind of purplish gray, but in real life, that looks red. Um, and so again, with the layering, this is probably an earlier pictograph um, or portion of a pictograph that somebody laid this classic vernal style anthropomorph over on top of. So don't, don't worry too much about this. We don't think it's related, um, but you could see, you know, we spent a lot of time in the field and then again in the lab 
really outlining um, and trying to get a lot of the details right for these anthropomorphs. Um, and you can also see with this person, we're missing some pieces of them, probably because they were drawn in color. So here's what's missing is ochre, right? We've got some reddish brown ochre. Uh, we've got some yellow ochre. You can mix these ochres um, with obviously different, different colors of just ferrous oxide stained clay. You can also mix them with different natural elements to create new colors, um, such as the example here from the Mullen Reef. Um, we've got this line of, uh, of figures and you can see here <laughs> some of some of their paint didn't last very long. It looks like it might have, when it spalled off, taken some of the uh, the salts with it and left this kind of ghostly shape. These guys who are still here, they're like three or four different colors of red, and you know we're getting into that kind of dark purpley too. So people were really adept at making colors. There's every reason to think that people were using color on a lot of these panels, and. It just doesn't last over time. Um, as the sun hits it, as wind, rain hit it, as trees and uh, sagebrush rubs up against it, it just doesn't last. So really when you get into alcoves, uh, like here down in Bears Ears, where we have um, the poorly named All-American Man, that you can see that people were using a lot of different colors. I mean, this blue is fantastic. Um, I don't think I've ever personally been able to see blue. But, you know, I'm just saying, these pigments wash away. And so as we were analyzing these things, we were keeping in mind that we have incomplete data. Um, we can only work with the data we have. It shouldn't scare us away from taking a big swing and trying something. But we're missing some stuff. And like I said, we're also missing body parts um, for two reasons. So we're missing colors, and that means that we're left with just one color rendered through a technique in most cases. We're only getting the petroglyph part. So when we disentangle each anthro, we can start to see, okay, well, these are the pieces parts that tend to be portrayed with uh, a, a petroglyph style. And so, you know, we've got these folks who we've got them, you know, tip to toe, beautiful, we've got everything. Maybe there was some color in here, maybe not, unknowable. But then this person, right? We've really only got their collar and a belt and possibly some sort of body design or maybe a shirt, but we don't have anything else. There's, there was no head, there were no arms, there were no legs. Um, really commonly legs were not depicted. Uh, so perhaps those were drawn on in a, in a pigment. So each of these got coded as an individual anthro in our database. Um, just so that we could do a comparison and say, all right, well, how many people do have, you know, collar necklaces? How many people do have five-toed feet? Um, the other sort of incomplete anthro that did get coded in our database are um, severed heads. We do have a good many severed heads, particularly on the uh, eastern and central side, no, sorry, western and central side of our project area. These were coded as an anthro as well. Uh, there's probably a lot of future research to be done comparing how uh, how the the head, the weeping eye motif, et cetera, were portrayed on these and if that is st statistically significant from the holders and um, other people who were drawn around the same time period. So whew, we did a lot of stuff, guys. All right, and here's why getting the details right really matter. Um, I think most reasonable people would think that we've gone too far. For 500 anthros, we went through this grueling process in the field and the lab of teasing apart what images constitute individual human figures. Then we classified each detail that each anthro was wearing. In the field, 20 of us were making these data, including Troy, a few other folks here um, that I saw in the chat. Um, and then afterwards, there were just three of us working through it in the lab to finally generate a database. And it was it was pretty exhausting work. Here's our guy. I think guy. I shouldn't have said. So it was exhausting work. Um, but we're finally at the point where we get to start to see why it was worth it. So 
Before I dive into statistics, I want to rehumanize people one more time. We're going to start putting people back together just a little bit. Um, without colors to show the complete anthropomorph and with the disadvantage of all these layers on top of each other, and with just the passage of time, it becomes really hard to see the people behind rock imagery. Fortunately, archaeology can fill in a lot of these gaps. So I have a few examples of clothing and jewelry to help us see who the Fremont were and how they chose to visually represent themselves. And this is really important um, because everything that was drawn here was a choice. Um, and it's always worth remembering that these are not Polaroids. These are not candid photographs. This was something that took a lot of time. There was probably an artisan at work who was the person in their community who was either um, allowed to draw it or had the technical capability to draw. So it's important what's on here. So we have a lot of different attributes. I'm gonna post up some pictures of jewelry and things, beads. I'm in no way saying that like this was absolutely an ear bob. I don't know. I just think that these are beautiful pieces of jewelry that'll help to humanize people. And I want I want you to get a sense of how um, how gorgeous this would have been. We have a bunch of different styles of beads. We have this malachite bead that was um, polished. We have beads made from local materials like gypsum, like slate. Gypsum's everywhere, guys. And gypsum's uh, really great because it carves super easily, super nicely. And it has kind of a, a sparkly sheen to it, um, kind of sugary almost. We also have this olivella shell bead. Remember how I said we had trade from California? This shell bead probably came to us from at the very nearest, um, the Gulf of California, uh, where Baja California meets mainland Mexico. That would have been the very nearest, but I mean, it, it could have been from more like the Channel Islands area. We, we simply don't know. Um, these are some more of those gypsum beads. Um, you know, these are, Pushing a thousand years old, so they're not as shiny as they probably once were. Uh, we've also seen a fossil of a shell, which is really fascinating. Um, and it looked like that had been polished really nicely too. Um, and I mentioned that sandals were not year round attire for people in the Uinta Basin. So here is a uh, moccasin. I do believe that this is probably later in time, more like Ute, um, but I wanted you to, to be able to see it to get a sense of like, yeah, people were. You know, this person who's pictured here is barefooted. We also see a lot of people wearing shoes. Um, Fremont hawk moccasins in particular are so lovely because you're taking the, the back hawk of a deer. You, we have mule deer out here. You're skinning it and then you're taking the whole piece and you're flipping it inside out and sewing it together in a really particular way such that the, um, the fur is on the inside to keep warm and the dew claw on the hawk is at the heel so you make a like a clicking sound as you walk so you kind of have tap shoes um which is just a really cool shoe so again we've got a lot of information here i'm going to show you a little bit about what we did code each item of clothing each piece of jewelry and even how the human body itself was portrayed all of these things were intentional choices by the creator of the rock imagery. What we can do as archaeologists is work backwards from the huge pile of information that we see on the rocks and look for trends and surprises that can point us in the direction of understanding more about the people who made these design choices. So our database of measured attributes, and measured attributes are pieces and parts of the designed human form. This database is huge. Uh, for each of our recorded anthros, we classified all these components. Many attributes had only a handful of types within them, such as for head shape, they were generally round or square, trapezoidal, inverted trapezoid, something like that. But other attributes like headdress had over 30 different options that we found. And this is not exhaustive. This is a big sample, but it's by, by no means every single anthropomorph out in the Uinta Basin. Um, there are some aspects of regalia that the Fremont really diversified and other aspects that had many fewer options for expression. It's cool right there. 
through our recording process, we could see that regional variation existed. Um, I mean, just moving from site to site, you could see that there were differences. But what we couldn't tell on the ground is how robust these differences were. Um, and now we didn't know the why. Um, testing the why for why variation exists is the driving question behind anthropological archaeology. I mean, like, sure, people dress differently, right? Like, but why are they dressing differently? So considering in our modern world, we dress differently when we're in public versus private spaces. Uh, my cool example right now is I'm in a public space. I've got a nice vest on. I've got a colored shirt, but we're on Zoom and 100% I'm going to bed after this. So I do have sweatpants on and slippers. Private spaces, public versus private spaces. I would never dress like this if we were meeting face-to-face. -face. Um, formal versus informal events. We even dress differently based on our occupations. Um, doctors wear lab coats. Firefighters wear helmets. Um, we even dress differently based on our life stage, right? I would not be caught dead wearing what my four-year-old wears. So there's a lot of future research to be made with this database. What I'm doing here tonight is just testing regional variation. So I've created regions based on watershed. These are areas where clusters of rock imagery sites and panels are in close proximity to each other and a year-round source of water. So archaeologists really love themselves some regional variation because it's super easy to measure. And it's not at all because regional variation, geographic variation, is meaningful in and of itself. People wouldn't necessarily make different rock imagery because I live on this side of town and you live on that side of town. But people from different regions might be members of different identity groups or the town sites might have shifted over time. And so you're seeing a representation of different time periods or there's something particular about how this region was being used, right? Maybe it's a shrine for something in particular, or maybe this is a more secular, profane space. Um, there's just a lot of different things that can be represented this way. And geography is a good proxy indicator for things that are going on. And those are the things that we're really interested in. So I just tested to see whether there is regional variation as a way to start generating other hypotheses, the really exciting stuff. All right. I know that not everyone loves math. So if you love math, on the left side of the screen, numbers and stuff. On the right side of the screen, cool de-stretched <laughs> image. Pick whatever you need to for the next minute and a half. So the question I asked the data was, are anthros in watersheds actually different from one another? If we're thinking, if we're thinking that this is, uh, that classic Bernal style is one monolith, then they should appear the same. Um, the hypothesis should be, there's not regional variation, right? Um, however, if there is regional differences, then we will reject the null hypothesis that, that everything is the same. And we'll say, all right, there's a little difference going on. So I use the Pearson's chi-square test to get at the answer. The Pearson's chi-square test, or statistic rather, tests whether two variables or multiple variables are independent. If the significance value is less than 0 0.05, and that's your p value, um, then we reject the hypothesis that they're independent. Um, we consider that they might be in some way related. Um, the Pearson's chi square statistics suggests that some attributes are patterned differently in different watersheds, while others are less good indicators. When I ran a preliminary analysis this fall, I had slightly different results than what's presented here. After combing through the data one more time, um, it appears that nearly everything does have a different regional flavor. And um, so there's a lot of complexity behind these patterns. We're going to get into a little bit of the East and the West. So here's where it gets interesting. Like I said, uh, Polly Shaftsma back in the 70s did suggest that there was a difference. Um, she had sort of said maybe in Ashley Dry Fork on the Western side of, of the project area, we're seeing something different than what's on the eastern side of the project area that's more like Cub Creek and uh, Dinosaur National Monument. So diving within the chi-square results, I could pull out which attributes were more or less present in each region than would have been expected. 
Um, so just really quickly, I've got three different examples of attributes. Um, so in the West, we do see that we have more of a flared headdress. Um, we don't see that as much or maybe at all in the central and eastern portions. I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's really just a dry fork phenomenon. Um, fringed horns are really common um, as are what, something that we call plain rectangular hats, which might be a flared headdress. They just kind of look more like that. It's a little bit tricky for us to see because across time styles might have changed as well. Um, in the central area, we see that people had a double incurved horn a little bit more frequently. Um, and on the Eastern side, we, we have a lot more diversity, honestly. So um, people had a planar rectangular band, not quite as big as a rectangular hat. Um, they did have a planar rectangular hat. Um, the fringed horns were back, but so were out curved horns in a big way. Um, so we do have some examples from um, museums, from photographs of what these headdresses could be. I don't know that I'm necessarily ready to take that jump, and especially because we have so much diversity with these headdresses. Um, this was by far and away, this and torsos were our, our most um, like, I keep saying it, but diverse uh, attribute set. And so I threw this one in especially for Troy because I know he is haunted by head shapes um, because we do find some round heads. This is not the best example of a round head. Um, I did have someone uh, who was classifying this and I think this is probably, this might've been a Glen Canyon five. I'm not 100% sure, but we do have for sure some round heads. Um, much as it pains Troy, I think he'll tell you that he's seen them in the flesh. Um, commonly in the West, we have uh, inverted trapezoidal heads um, or just straight trapezoidal heads. Um, and then in the East, we also have kind of squared off and then no head shape means we had eyes, mouth, we had everything else, we might've had ear bobs, but we didn't have a face portrayed. So if a face outline was ever portrayed, that was probably as paint. Um, again, you know, without trying to get into figuring out why these head shapes are the way they are, Obviously human heads are like more or less the same. Um, so it might've been a silhouette of something that they were wearing on their head or perhaps a hairstyle. And then my favorite thing um, and where I would like to really poke into a little bit deeper in the future um, are our necklaces. So we had a lot of variety in necklace, not as much as headdress. Um, we classified things as beaded strand necklace, a solid pecked or stipple pecked collar, and we had some segmented collars as well. Um, we also have a different category for a, a choker necklace. So um, this person up here is wearing what we would have classified as a choker necklace. Um, those were also like very much a Western pattern and not an Eastern pattern. That just didn't make a very compelling looking slide. Um, so in the West, uh, these beaded strand necklaces are really the dominant uh, type. We have different um, sub variants within bead strand necklace, but we really need to dive into that a lot more to understand it a lot better. Um, that's probably also something where we can get really into dating in the future because we do have so many of these beads and things like these oval beads versus these um, kind of squared off beads. We can find those archaeologically and we can get them into a nice dated context, like maybe we're off the races. Um, so in the West, we've got a lot more diversity, but in general, we're looking at individual beads. In the central area, this is like the only place where the central area like really had its own flavor and not just of being a blend of East and West. We had a lot of these solid pecked collar necklaces. Um, I'm not sure what, what this would have been made of if this would have been, um, a lot of beads so close together that they felt like it was just easier to peck it as a collar or if this is something else entirely, right? But it is its own specific thing. We see it repeated enough times um, to feel confident about that. They go mostly straight down and over, right? Um, unlike this, that kind of has a nice drapey thing. Um, in the East, nothing distinctive, not to say they didn't have necklaces, just wasn't really distinctive necklaces. 
And so we've got a lot more to do. Um, this is just the start. This is, like I said, archaeologists start by classifying. So I was like, let's just test the classification. And it's pretty robust. Um, in general, classic vernal style hangs together as classic vernal style. When you drill down into it, you do see some variation that is meaningful and is worth taking a, a closer look at. And this geographic variation is just the start of understanding the Fremont. So we need to work on better dating these images to examine change over time. We also need to continue along the lines that Linda McNeil is exploring and learn more about the, you know, the community and ethnic identities behind uh, the Fremont. We also need to examine the material culture that we already have in museums in more detail. All of the photographs I showed tonight of, of material culture, they're all from museums. Not nearly enough people are taking a look at them, taking a look back at the archaeological um, field notes that, where they were generated and piecing together aspects of timeline, of site structure, looking at differences between sites. We just haven't done it. We excavated this material and moved on. So we need to go back and finish the work. So what we've demonstrated that is that something really cool is absolutely happening in this corner of the Fremont world, and it's showing up in rock imagery. But right now, we're all blind people touching different parts of the elephant. And as long as more of us blind people get a hand on it, and as long as we have open and clear communication with one another, we're sure to learn something really amazing about the past peoples of the Uinta Basin. And quickly, before I say thank yous and we take questions, um, I just, I need to urge you all to continue to take care of these places. It is not a guarantee that we get to interact with the past in this way. Um, and it's everyone's responsibility to make sure that these places are protected for the future. I know it's um, snowy for most of us in the Northern Hemisphere, so you're probably not visiting sites like next weekend. Um, but the next time you are out, please remember to take nothing and to leave nothing to watch your step. Archaeological sites are places on the earth where we know that humans can leave an impression. And we're humans too, so we need to tread lightly. Whew, that's what I got, guys. Thank you for hanging in. Um, it was it was wonderful to get to talk to you all tonight. And a huge thank you to so many people who helped. Um, where I work, the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, they've obviously um, invested a lot in, in helping me um, achieve this research. The uh, Utah Rock Art Research Association was a massive funder for this. And I cannot thank them enough for their help in really jump-starting this research. Um, they were a funder and also we had so many volunteers from Urara come out and it was really wonderful. Jess Fulmer and Kate Anderson were my research assistants who did so many of those little pointillism dots. Um, they still talk to me, which is amazing. Darlene was an incredible help on the ground. She is a wealth of knowledge. Barbie Bar Corporation and Dr. Larry Wilkin were kind enough to allow me access to their private property. Linda McNeil is an absolute powerhouse. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad to have been able to talk to her about this stuff. And then of course the museums, um, Utah County Heritage Museum and the Utah Fieldhouse Natural History State Park Museum. Um, they were very generous in opening up their collections um, to let me take a look. So boy, if anyone is still awake, I think we can take some questions, Troy, if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna take over. Well, hi there. Actually, I'm not Troy, but I will take over and handle the uh, question session. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. I, I suspect you kept a lot of us awake. Um, so if anybody would like to address some, uh, Elizabeth, some questions, please use the chat. Um, I suspect there's lots of stuff uh, she'd be happy to share with us. But let's start out with some questions that have come in so far. Um, so one question was about the sandals. And in some, you may have kind of answered this, but um, I'll ask it anyway, just in case, just to clear, in case you want to put any clarification in. Which the question is that Fremont used moccasins as well. So were sandals a regional variation? Were they in use throughout the Fremont region, or is it just a matter of time of year? Yeah, that's a really great question. So we do find sandals in pretty much everywhere that we find. Um, 
Screamont uh, clothing. So it's it's hard to find sandals, just like it's hard to find moccasins because they get eaten by bugs, they get blown away, um, they get damaged. So whenever we do find alcoves, um, not whenever, but when we find alcoves, it's not uncommon to find sandals. Um, the sandals really run the gamut. They're they're not quite like the Pueblo sandals that were um, like super duper, like small pieces of thread really woven together in, in really intricate ways and like soles that have um, cool designs on them. The Fremont sandals look a little bit more um, like disposable is not the word, but maybe expedient. Um, pardon, probably again, because unlike in Bluff that I guess was able to launch hot air balloons today, we've got like three feet of snow. Um, but yeah, we do find sandals. People were making sandals. And I have a few questions that were direct messaged to me. I can go through a few of those. Peter. Sure. Um, uh, let me just finish with the ones that I've got here mm -hmm. and then, and then we can go to those. Great. Um, so people were asking about the, um, you know, I think you've probably used D-Stretch on this. Does D-Stretch help bring any of the colors back that were missing uh, maybe prior to D-Stretch? We didn't recognize them. Can we see them now? Yeah, I did D-Stretch all over the place. Um, I really love it. It um, more was good for confirming suspicions of like, is this a, you know, is this a, a red pigment? So we were able to get it pretty close and often you can kind of see that the red pigment is floating on top of the rock. There are some instances where it's really absorbed into the sandstone that the de-stretch was really helpful. Um, I don't think there was anything where we de-stretched it and we were confronted with something totally different. Um, but, you know, it, it is always really good to, to double check that. And so we were in the field double checking it all the time. In the lab, we were double checking using de-stretch. Um, I like using D-Stretch in a lot of these uh, presentations because my father is red-green colorblind. Um, he doesn't get to see a lot of this stuff. If you've got a red pigment on a brown sandstone, that's unfair to a segment of the, of the population. So I like to bring that in when I can. Um, okay, so a couple of questions about um, different areas. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one is how finite is the geographical area? You talked about uh, West Coast influences. Have you found influences from the plains, anything east of the Rockies? Um, in terms of materials, yes and no. So uh, there's a, a tool stone called Tiger Chert that comes from the Uintas, and that's about as far north as we see things coming in. We do find that... Um, North along the Green River, you're getting into Wyoming in a region called the Wyoming Basin. There are what we what look to all the world like um, Fremont Grayware up there, and potentially some Fremont Pit houses up there too. So um, we do see that there's there's some northward motion, but what we see mostly is an exporting of you into Basin stuff into the north. I don't know that we're seeing a lot of Northern things come down. I'm not an expert on that though. Uh, you're probably gonna to wanna to talk to a Wyoming archeologist, bring them down into the basin and see if they're like, oh, well, this is just, this is just the Dinwoody knockoff or something. Um, Cause again, my, my, my research is um, very much pointed at the rest of Utah. Sorry if that's not a great answer. Okay, uh, so more. Uh closer by someone asked about Canyon Pintado. How does Canyon Pintado uh, compare with the sites you're documenting? I would love to know. So Canyon Pintado is um, over in Colorado. And my understanding is in that area and in the Douglas Creek Arch area, there is another like big cluster of classic vernal style rock imagery. I have not made it over there myself. Um, here at the state of Utah, our, our cars do turn into pumpkins when we cross state lines. So it's, it's hard for me in my day-to-day -day life to get over there. Um, but I do look forward to visiting it and seeing if we can expand the database. Um, because that's, uh, that's quite a bit farther away than even just the Eastern and Western portions of this study area. The study area is by no means where we see classic vernal style. So I, 
I don't know a heck of a lot about Canyon Pintado. I am aware of it. Hopefully I can get back to you soon about that. Okay, another kind of similar question. Um, person asks, it appears that there are classic vernal anthros down in the Capitol Reef area, but not so many in say Nine Mile Canyon. And any ideas why this might be the case? So weird, right? We don't see a lot of classic vernal style in Nine Mile Canyon. We do a little bit, um, but in Nine Mile Canyon, people tend not to, like classic vernal style, one of the real hallmarks of it, and I didn't get into it, and I should have, is this regalia, is that they are absolutely dressed to the nines. Um, there was a lot of time and care spent on elaborating a lot of this detail. Um, in the Tavaputs Plateau in, in Nine Mile Canyon and, and other sorts of areas, we don't see that a ton. Um, San Rafael, I don't know if we're seeing classic vernal style or if the San Rafael style just has a lot of that same regalia to it. Um, because there does seem like there was a huge population of, of people down in the San Rafael swell as well. Um, it's a really well watered but deserty area. Um, it's a really striking environment. I, I encourage you guys to visit it. But I think it's San Rafael style. I don't think it's necessarily classic vernal style. I think they're just really closely related. And um, with all of the Fremont rock imagery, I mean, they have something more in common than they have not in common, right? Um, we call the Fremont one chunk um, because there's something there that's binding them all together. There is some sort of shared ideology or shared like visual lexicon that people are able to pick up on as they move from one area to another. So if us, if you as a modern observer, see the same thing from one area to another, you're just reading the same visual lexicon is what I would guess. Yeah, okay. So uh, I had a question about, you started off the uh, talk talking about migrations going on. Um, and then we have, um, you know, these these images with these severed heads and such. So does the does the rock art give us any information of the nature of these migrations? So were they conflict ridden? You know, did cultures fill in spaces that weren't inhabited? Um, you know, what what do we know about the way these migrations uh, or what you know how, how these migrations happened and, and what kinds of uh, relationships the new incoming people had with the people who were already there man absolutely this was this was one of the things that started my thesis research that i didn't get to get to because i was doing human behavioral ecology and it's hard just to talk about warfare in that context and the first thing we needed to think about was, well, do we have the confluence of factors that would drive people to violence? Should we expect there to be violence? Can we model this? And so what I was actually looking at was radiocarbon dates as a proxy indicator of population. So more radiocarbon dates should equal more people just because you have more cook fires that we find, um, you know, more, more evidence of habitation that we find. And then on the other side, uh, my independent variable was um, precipitation that I got through tree ring dates. And so I lined those up and I said, all right, as we're seeing the population increasing, are we seeing that the uh, carrying capacity of the land is able to keep up with it? And if not, are there periods where we should expect conflict? And what I found was that at no point in the face and free history, would it have been such that someone couldn't have just moved? Um, so, I mean, violence might be someone's first response, but we shouldn't expect that it's someone's first response. If, if two humans are vying for a resource and there's another resource available somewhere else, those humans might get into an armed conflict, but it's more likely that one person will move away. Um, and so we're not seeing the conditions for warfare or some sort of like widespread violence, um, nor my understanding is do we see it in the archeological record of the human remains we have. I don't know that we're seeing um, person on person violence, right? Violence um, in, in people's bones that are caused by tools or defensive stuff. I don't know that we're seeing that um, any more than is just sort of the background noise of 
people being people and getting into fights. So weird. Yeah. So those severed heads, they might not represent um, actual severed heads. They might represent something else. Um, it's it's not a photograph of something that happened, right? It might be more symbolic or metaphorical. Yeah. On the other hand, a lot of the designs and such that you're seeing there, you feel do represent uh, things that are almost photographic. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. So I'm not necessarily suggesting, can let me share my screen one more time. I'm not suggesting that these folks who were here are necessarily that anyone ever put on all of this stuff at once. I mean, maybe, but what we do know is we do find beads that are this big. We do find beads that are this big. Um, you know, if, if this is a shirt, we do find examples in the Pueblo world of like lace shirts, right? Something like this, a nice lacy shirt. Um, even this flared headdress, we do, we do have an example of something that looks a lot like this from Mantle Cave. Uh, that's a, a made of um, Northern Flicker, so woodpecker. Um, so we do find some correlates for it. So I'm not necessarily saying that folks were wearing all of this at the same time, but I do think that these things did exist. This, you can't think the unthinkable thought, right? You need to know like, oh, these, this, these pieces of jewelry exist. To be able to say, I want to picture someone with pieces of jewelry. I, I know I can sever a head, but I've never done it. I mean, maybe I can't, but I know it's possible. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that these are meaningful and I do think that they're conveying information about someone's social stature, about someone's occupation, maybe about um, ceremonies that they were tied into. And I think that this is conveying information too. I just don't necessarily think that this means that each one of these and, and this guy here, I don't necessarily think that we had that many people who did have severed heads in the Uinta Basin. Does that make sense? Um, I don't yeah, know. I that's we, we don't really know for sure one way or the other yet. We um, don't. I guess is is really the, the point. We um, don't. There, I guess there's here's a similar question that's that I'd say is related, and that is um, it says your coding is similar. To, um, oh, hold on here now. I've yeah, your coding is similar to what is being seen on figurines. And could you speak yeah. to how the figurines may help expand what you are seeing and learning from the rock art? Oh my gosh. Yeah, they're really similar to figurines, huh? Um, so the figurines that we have a lot of are the Pillings figurines. Um, there's some other figurines that I know of that are from the San Rafael Swell area, where we're getting that San Rafael rock imagery again. Um, so I'm not super sure how it lines up with figurines. Um, I will say like a hearty yes, there, there is something there that needs to be investigated and looked at. I have not done that myself. Um, but yeah, we do see, especially with the face paint, um, figurines, actually, let me share my screen again, because I can zoot back to a couple of the Pillings figurines. Zoot all the way back here. So much. All right, here's these guys. Um, so we do see, you know, this is not necessarily the weeping eye motif, and we do see a lot of weeping eye, but um, eyes being featured as kind of ovals. These are more slits than ovals, but we do see that. Um, eyes are almost, we didn't track variation in eyes because there really wasn't, and we didn't track variation in mouths for really the same reason either, because eyes do just tend to be small ovals. Um, this person has some face paint that we don't necessarily see elsewhere. Um, this person has a really great face band that looks like, you know, there was a different color in here that's popped off over time. I'm not sure if that would have been a woven pattern or if that would have been um, beads interspersed in there. But, you know, we do, we do find a fair number of forehead bands. Um, same thing with the necklaces, right? We do find an awful lot of beads this shape. The malachite bead that I showed is this same sort of shape too. Um, I don't know if this is an ear bob or if this is trying to represent something else, but yeah, so there's a lot of overlap. Um, I have not gone through the existing figurines to 
see how it compares, but the figurines are not generally from the Uinta Basin. The figurines are generally from central Utah. So if I was going to guess, I would say they probably are gonna look a lot more similar to the rock imagery in um, the San Rafael Swell than they would necessarily look in the, in the uh, Uinta Basin. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question here on the transition from the late archaic uh, to Fremont. Um, are there, okay, so it suggests are Rochester or let's see, Musson touch it. I don't know that particular site, maybe good examples of this. Are there examples of this up in the Unita Vernal area? So the Can you repeat the very first part of that? Yeah, talking about the transition from late archaic, um, like BCS to Fremont. Um, yes, I'm actually going to not answer that question because there is someone who is working on that area of time right now. So I don't want to jump the gun on that, but could be really exciting. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so we'll have a future future lecture on that question. Yeah. Um, Okay, so here's another question about conflict. Um, have you found any depictions of colonization conflict, or do all of these examples predate that? This predates um, this predates uh, European Americans really arriving on the continent and then um, filtering in. So, in the Uinta Basin, um, probably certainly diseases reached that area before um, European Americans did. And in a lot of cases, like European American material culture reached the area before a lot of European Americans did. We don't see a lot of European Americans until really about the mid 1800s. Um, we have some fur trappers who came through. And um, shortly thereafter, we just had, you know, LDS migration, transcontinental railroad, just explosion of, of ranching in the West. So, um, it was a really rapid domino effect as soon as European Americans did, you know, make landfall as it were um, in the Uinta Basin. But here at 1300 AD, we, we didn't see a lot of that. And so um, on the rock imagery, we do see a lot of Ute rock imagery. And so there is, you know, the introduction of the horse was obviously major for people in that, in that time period. Um, so we do see some of the, the stuff of colonization, um, I would have to really double check. I'm not an expert in Ute rock imagery. I would have to check to see if we have anything else that would be um, a more direct versus like indirect aspect of colonization. Okay, thanks. Um, that's all the questions that I have in my chat. If you have some that uh, you'd like to address that are different from those, please okay. go ahead now. Let's, let's see. Um, so uh, Marilyn G had asked if we could tell if the red pictograph was under or over the petroglyph. And so that was that example that I, I used a lot because it's just a really fabulous drawing. Yes, we can tell um, because you've got to get really close. And then you can see when you have the red underneath, the pecked, uh, the pecked petroglyph actually removes some of that red. And so we also have examples where there's paint on top of it. And in fact, uh, that is the McConkie Ranch site. And at McConkie Ranch, we notice that there's two different colors of pigment. The darker, more purpley red appears to be older, and the very ready red appears to be younger. Um, and so it looks like people, especially on the severed heads, have gone and painted a very red red under the severed heads to, um, to sort of look like bleeding. Um, we don't know that that was original, uh, but certainly sometime after the petroglyph came on the scene, um, someone did further elaborate it with that. So it's pretty cool. We can tell before and after. Where it got really tricky was when it was petroglyph on top of petroglyph. That was a real bummer because um, it's really hard to see who, who was pecking what and when. So a lot of times we would have to just go with context clues and say, all right, well, the rest of the the rest of the necklace here looks like this and it's on you know this guy's belt like this so we can't necessarily tell what the different time period is but we can tell that there are two distinct people 
And from there we can tell, all right, here's where the necklace is, here's where the belt is. Yeah, so you don't, you don't see differences in patination between different uh, packing uh, designs? No, you know, this is, I think it's Frontier Sandstone and there's not a ton of patina that's going on with it. Um, so yeah, we don't see a ton of pat like patination. And when there was differences in patina, we would obviously go on that. Um, older stuff, like we did find some Glen Canyon 5, like, and that, I guess that one's easy because that's a totally different style. So that was nice to see. But yeah, if we did have a different patination, we would go with that. Um, someone who has also asked if the layering of one picture over another was improving or adding to the story. We don't know. Um, it could have been, it could have been improving or adding to the story, or it could have been um, taking taking the influence of the story and putting yourself on top of it. Um, we know that these are these are spaces of importance for some reason that people are coming back to them again and again. And so, if you had something that's really important here. Maybe if it's from a different group of people, maybe a different group of people that you're not real chummy with, maybe you put your thing on top to obliterate what's underneath, or maybe you're doing it in homage to it. Maybe you're like, I am, you know, I am the descendant of these people. It's not clear. Um, I think there's a really good opportunity there to think through maybe two different models and figure out what you would expect to see in each of these cases. And then go through the database and see like, okay, do we see this? Do we see that it's obliterating or do we see that it's honoring? Um, Cause I don't know. It's cool. Do you, do you have any archaic uh, rock art there? Do we have archaic? Um, yeah, possibly. So in this area, our archaic rock imagery tends to be more abstract. Sometimes we get a lot of um, like animals, mostly bighorn sheep, uh, some deer, so we don't have a ton of that. It's honestly mostly humans, which is just so cool. Um, but we do have like those concentric circles at one site I showed you. Um, we do have some other areas of concentric circles where those appear to be much, much older than um, some of the anthros that are around. Yeah, do you but, think that the lack of archaic uh, rock art on those sites, which are obviously good uh, surfaces to carve into, does that indicate maybe that there wasn't that much of an archaic presence? Oh, I can tell you there wasn't that much of an archaic presence. I mean, when we're looking at the radiocarbon dates, um, it is like orders of magnitude. The So the archaic period is pretty flat. The late archaic, you get a bump, but it's a tiny bump. And then it goes whoop, just mm -hmm. straight up. Um, so we're seeing orders of magnitude more people in the Fremont area in the Fremont time period. Um, we're also sort of thinking that it seems like there's a lot, like they're they're presenting a lot of different social stuff in the rock art. And so there's probably, no, we know there's more um, more complicated social organization when you get larger groups of people, especially people who want to settle down, people who are in direct competition for immovable resources like agricultural land. So there's a lot more um, social diversification going on. There's probably, you know, new occupations coming about. Um, so people are working through a lot of that in the rock imagery in a way that there wasn't a cause to for the late archaic and earlier archaic. Yeah. So do you have any more questions in your chat? I have a lot, but we don't need to go. <laughs> I feel um, bad, but um, am I going to use AI to help decipher images? I don't think, I don't think so. I don't know that AI can. Peter, do you have any experience with AI for this sort of stuff? Um, I think it's it's plausible. You'd need uh, a number of examples that you know you yeah. can identify. Um, so I wouldn't rule it out. It's something that we could probably work on in the future. Yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of examples and Darlene was contacting me and she found more, <laughs> so mm. we could, but I I don't know. The thing I'm probably gonna do next is um, measure a lot of beads, so it's boring. Mm. And then someone asked of the 500 anthros, how many are holding severed heads? I'm going to, I actually haven't counted, but um, I would I would venture to guess fewer than 25. 
Yeah, they the just severed, stick out in our memories. <laughs> they really do. The, the severed head phenomenon really occurs the most, as far as I remember, the most at McKee Springs, and it doesn't happen often, but it's very memorable. It's a very big panel right? Um, where a guy is very proudly like holding maybe a shield in one hand or, or and, you know, the severed head. And they're always the same. It's always, you've got a, a piece of like cord or twine here that's holding the head right at the crook of the arm. Um, and then the other place where we just find a lot of them are um, McConkie Ranch and in that area. Didn't find them too much elsewhere. Yeah. Um, okay, so Troy adds in one comment on the archaic. He says very little archaic in this area. He, he says he thinks it's too far north. The Glen Canyon style five images are infrequent. Um, and along with some barrier canyon imagery are the only archaic that he can think of. So that goes along with what you were saying. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, he knows this area super well. Um, I think so I that might be. Any other ones you want to address here? Um, <laughs> that might be most of it. I'm I'm going through, and I think that I think that covers a lot of the questions. So. Oof. Well, great. Um, we look forward to hearing more uh, on that that topic as as you and your students and colleagues. Uh, come up with new results. So I would like to thank you again, Elizabeth, for your presentation. And thanks, of course, to all the attendees for your interest. And I remind you, if you'd like to learn more about Aurora or get involved, please check out our website, our Facebook pages. We invite everyone to renew or join our membership, of course, to support the study and conservation of rock art. And our next online lecture will be February 10th. Uh, and the speaker will be me. Uh, Peter Anik, and I'll be presenting a collection of Paleolithic rock art sites from Iberia that have been making archaeological news recently. So we'll, we'll get into a different part of the world here next month. So for now, um, until next time, good night and stay safe. <laughs>